Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our reading with Jessica Jacobs, uh, illustrious Smith College alum, class of 2002, former resident of what she claims is the greatest Smith house of all time. I actually don't know where she lived. I don't know. So she never said that. So um, it's such a thrill to invite um, Jessica back to campus. I have to say that um, one of my absolute favorite perks about being the director of the Butel Day Poetry Center is that I sometimes get to hang out with Jessica Jacobs. Um, it is always a thrill to have her back on campus, to have her connect with students, um, to talk poetry, um, to talk smack, uh, to gossip, exchange dog gifs, um, and to spend some time questioning my life choices whenever I'm around her amazing awesomeness. Um, don't tell her any of this, please. Um, so just a few announcements, as always, before we get going. Um, uh, Jessica, tonight will be introduced by our uh, core intern, SJ Waring. Um, yes. Um, and then uh, that, uh, after that, Jessica will read poems. Um, we'll do our awkward little change of the stage setup that we do. Um, and then the conversation, um, Jessica will have a conversation with uh, Shoshana Oladort. Um, and I'll be introducing both SJ and uh, Shoshana in just a minute. Um, and that will be followed by a book signing right over there at the purple tablecloth. Um, I just, I do want to make a pitch. Um, I hope some of you maybe picked one up on the way in. This profound and dazzling book on a loan is for sale um, back there in the atrium uh, from our friends from Broadside Book. As always, um, please do yourself a favor and pick one of these up. Um, I also want to thank our, we have a number of co-sponsors um, on campus for tonight's event, uh, which I'm really grateful for. It's the Center for Religious and Spiritual Life, the Programs in Jewish Studies and the Study of Women and Gender, and the Departments of Religion and English Language and Literature. Um, thank you all for making this event possible and for getting the word out across campus. Um, I want to thank Jeff and Dan and Tom for facilitating today, tonight's um, online streaming. Um, and a special welcome to everyone who is joining us online, most especially to Jessica's dad. Hello. <laughs> Shout out to Jessica's dad. <laughs> Um, English 112, my students, um, just please remember to scan the QR code before you leave. Those will be posted um, toward the end of the event. Um, please, if you can, silence your cell phones. Um, and then I just want to make sure everyone knows about uh, three really, really exciting uh, events that we have to round out our season um, in April. Um, our poet Nikki Beer will be here on April 9th reading with um, this year's winners of our high school contest for girls. Um, on April 16th, we will have Yona Harvey's capstone students um, reading for us here. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then, of course, we're rounding things out on April 30th with U.S. poet Ada Lamone. Um, and that will, that's the one event um, of this season that will be taking place in John M. Green. All those events will otherwise be at 7 o'clock, um, and that one also will be at 7 a.m., but otherwise they're here in Weinstein. Um, I want to read the bios for tonight's um, guests. Um, Shoshana Oladort, who will be moderating tonight's discussion with Jessica, is a writer, translator, and critic. She holds, a PH she holds a PhD in comparative literature from Stanford University, is the web editor at the Poetry Foundation, and is currently a visiting lecturer in English at Amherst College. Shoshana's work has appeared in Lit Hub, the Los Angeles Review of Books, The New Republic, The Paris Review, and The Times Literary Sub Subla sorry, Supplement, excuse me, among many other outlets. Um, Shoshana recently relocated to Western Mass from Los Angeles, and we are really lucky to have her here in the Valley. And introducing Jessica tonight is S.J. Waring. S.J. is a senior at Smith College with a major in English, a minor in Jewish studies, and a poetry concentration. For the past several semesters, she has been an absolutely fabulous core intern at the Boutel Day Poetry Center, where we occasionally discuss the ghost of Sylvia Plath and argue about candy bar preferences. S.J.'s writing has been published online in Hey Alma and a few other places, but, and this is what she wrote, she won't tell you where. Please welcome S.J. Waring.
I didn't write the part about being fantastic and amazing, though. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, okay. Thank you all for joining us tonight, whether here in Northampton or elsewhere on streaming. Opening Jessica Jacobs' new book, Unalone, for the first time, I felt recognized. I connected to Unalone as a book of Midrash in which Jacobs darts between the pages of the book of Genesis, discovering new ways to zip herself into Judaism as a queer woman negotiating the intricacies of modern life. With a Parsha by Parsha approach and an expansive notes section, Unalone itself is a living document, bridging time and space, past and present, story and memory. But I also felt recognized as a poet by Jacob's ability to find what is holy everywhere. Her delicate, thoughtful craft applies the same sense of reverence to the covenant of Abraham as it does to a human hand, a morning run, a beloved dog. Her love for language, its forms and meanings is also evident. In Unalone's writing, as in Genesis itself, quote, each word carries what it names inside and, like a folded paper flower blooming in water, finds its form in the moment of its speaking. And also like Genesis, Unalone wrestles, sometimes literally, with what it means to have a relationship to the world. How do we honor the planet that bore us? What would it be like to trust in something beyond ourselves, to listen for a voice we never learned to hear? And how does one find the language for any of it? In an interview with the Jewish Book Council, Jacobs describes her role in writing the book as more of a conduit than a controller. This channeling is evident throughout on Alone, as reader and writer alike marvel at the mysteries of humanity, until in the very last poem, Aliyah, the Torah's tree of life takes root, body and text becoming one. At the end of this poem, Jacobs zooms out, revealing herself as part of a larger community of people who together have found something greater. Sorry. A vantage we could not have reached on our own, a vision otherwise beyond us, all of us in that overstory, unalone. At the heart of this book is this acknowledgement of human interdependence. In its final lines, unalone leaves the reader with the reassurance that no matter how vastly unknowable our world, we are here on this planet to explore it together. I could truly talk about this book forever, but luckily Jessica is here to do it instead. In addition to Unalone, Jessica Jacobs is the author of Pelvis with Distance, a biography of po in poems of Georgia O'Keeffe, as well as Take Me With You Wherever You're Going. Jacobs currently serves as the chapbook editor of Beloit Poetry Journal and is the founder and executive director of Yetzira, a hearth for Jewish poetry. I'm honored and thrilled to present Jessica Jacobs. SJ, will you travel with me? For the <laughs> um, hi, thank you all. Uh, so when I was a Smith student, uh, I really loved going to pick up mail. I don't know if it's, I think it's here at like the student center or something, but there's this tiny little post office on Green Street. Um, it was tight as a ship's hold, and it was a place of much flirting and eavesdropping and intrigue. Um, and my favorite days were the ones when I saw a postcard from the Poetry Center, which I knew meant I was about to meet a new to me poet who was going to take the top of my head off. I don't make any promises about that, but I'm just, you know. Um, and just as many of you are one day going to talk about how you studied with Tiana Clark, uh, I got to study with Eleanor Wilner and Jack Gilbert. Uh, and if you don't know their work, find it and your life will be better. I promise you that. Uh, I also got to meet Mary Oliver, Joy Graham, and hear Gwendolyn Brooks' very last reading, which was amazing. And these writers taught me that you can both write poems and live your life as though its own, it is its own kind of poem. One in which you approach moments of both joy and sorrow with deep attention and try to stay alive to wonder. 
So my thanks to Ellen Dore Watson for building the center over the years. Um, and deep gratitude to Jen Jabaley Blackburn, Adri Rose, and even Matt Donovan <laughs> um, for the ways in which you are growing it, which is so exciting. And I'm always looking forward to your, your emails. Um, and thank you, too, to all the departments who helped bring me here. Um, I want to tell you that when I was sitting out in the audience as a student, I dreamed of one day being up here. But that's, that's a lie. Um, it never occurred to me that could actually happen. Um, so it just means the world to me to be here with you today. Um, and now I'm going to read poems. So uh, as, as SJ beautifully said, um, this, this is a collection of poems in conversation with the book of Genesis. Um, I am shocked that I wrote this book uh, because I grew up in a very secular Jewish household, and by the age of 12, was just like, peace out religion, not for me, right? And I kind of, I ran into the religion of books, and that's what I did here at Smith. Um, and then I hit my 30s, and really big questions started to come up in my life about what is it to live a worthwhile life? Right? Like, what does it mean to be good? Right? All these big things. How do we live knowing we're going to die? And all of a sudden, I wanted books that were written not just five or even 50 years ago, but I wanted something ancient that I could be in conversation with. And I began reading, much to my surprise, the Torah, uh, or <laughs> the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament, as Christians call it. Um, and what that awakened in me was this desire to suddenly connect to something outside of myself. Um, so this first poem kind of tracks that process, uh, and also my move from Manhattan to Asheville, North Carolina, where I live now. It's called Ordinary Imminence. In New York, sidewalks were so crowded, it was easier to walk in the street. And three stories up from all the elbows and breath, always the same city dream. In the back of my cramped apartment, a door I'd somehow not seen. I'd press my ear to it and hear the cavernous echo of air arcing through hidden innumerable rooms. Rooms I owned but had never entered. Many years ago, many states away, in a far more spacious place, at the breaking of a garbage truck, at the creak and hoist of its mechanical arm, pinioning a block's length of bins to hoist and dump, I look up from a book and know, the truck outside rumbling away, my waist fraternizing with the waist of my neighbors, that I want to believe in God. Just like that, a new door in a room I thought I knew by heart. My hand is on the doorknob now, my ear to the grain. But what I hear is the crackling hum of light bulbs above, the tissued whisper of an iris opening, the deep breathing of the daily world. Nothing from the other side. How do you listen for a sound you've never heard? Or, more precisely, for a sound you know so well you've never heard it? Thank you. Snaps are why it's good to read in person, so. Um, but, you know, in this desire um, to connect was this idea of prayer, which was such a mystery to me, right? That I, I just, I, I had never done it. I didn't understand how it worked. Um, and then Matt was kind enough to reach out to me and say, hey, we're doing this project, this ekphrastic poetry project, which is when you write in response to art with the Smith College you know, Art Museum. Do you want to be a part of it? And they had just acquired the photography of Leslie Dill. Um, if you haven't seen her work, like go to the museum, it's incredible. She often, um, it's 
women's clothing, women's bodies, but she'll integrate text into the visual images. And the photo that I just could not stop looking at, it was a woman's throat kind of constricted, and it had painted on it um, the lines by Emily Dickinson, I am afraid to own a body, I am afraid to own a soul. Right, and, and that's how I felt, like that tightness of throat was how praying felt to me in that moment. And so I figured this was my chance to explore. So thank you, Matt, for that. And I sent him one section of this poem, and he said, I think you could do more. So this is a poem in three sections. Because you listen to Matt when he tells you that. <laughs> Prayers from a dark room. Gehenna, which is the one of the Jewish ideas of the afterlife. Um, and it's an idea that it's a place of reflection instead of a place of punishment. Gehenna. If hell is less fiery furnace than a mirrored room with all the lights left on, with nowhere to hide that what burns is within us, all the guilt and sorrow from which we now can't look away then let us accept our faces as they are. Let us remember that one word, doliket, means both in flames and full of light, and know our pain can be a source of sight. I am afraid to own a body, I am afraid to own a soul. In Eden, garments of light sufficed, each human a lantern lit from within, inextricable from their ignition. But now, banished, this dim skin suit, by which the spirit is dusked to firefly. Such faint flares, such cold glow, lonely lighthouses, each of us. We blink, we beacon, we long to chorus, we wait for a blaze in return until there. Allied, we pulse one to the next, bind in divine synchrony. For a moment, the whole planet, a field of fallen stars. And from this ensemble bonfire, like smoke scorching from the narrows of a throat, are fears. A cry of not ownership, but communion. A cry to be answered with expanse of air, of wind, of ruach, that God breath, gentling in toward every torn thing, its breach however meager, moving leaf into leaves, melding body to soul, making of every opening a mouth, and setting us all to singing. Can you hear it? A torch song for the kindred world, this fleeting one we're searching for. Prayer for the word made light. Bathe the window within us in photosensitive silver. Let us aperture, let us dilate. What lasts is what is found by light. Negatives of the divine, let us enter the stop bath of the ordinary world. Where we are most vulnerable, most exposed, that's what makes the print. We become what is burned into us, what we open ourselves to. Thank you. Uh, and one of the things I was struck by, by reading this ancient text in my 30s, was how it could somehow speak to everything that was happening around me. And it seemed to constantly be speaking to current events. Um, and so for me, I could not read about the flood and Noah's Ark without thinking about the climate crisis, right? And thinking about the fact that the people who are suffering most are the people who have contributed least to 
right to what's happening right now with the climate. Um, and what's interesting is Noah is said not to be a righteous man. He is the most righteous of his generation. Keep in mind, this is a generation that God's like, we're wiping you out. Like, this is over. So it's all relative. Um, and, and, and one of the, the ways that Moses is talked about is uh, there's this phrase, sadik impelts, right? Which means a righteous person in fur. And so it's this idea that, like, everybody around you is freezing and you're really cold. Well, the righteous person in furs takes a minute to put on a fur coat before helping anybody else versus a truly righteous person who, despite the fact that they're cold, gets warm by making a fire for everyone. So that's kind of what informed the thinking of this poem. Um, and one thing you should know is that the Hebrew word teva, which is normally translated as ark, like Noah's ark, can also mean word. Collective nouns. When Noah was still just a man, not yet sailor and savior, God said, make yourself a word, for I have decided to silence all flesh. Scraping muscle from a hide, his wife crouched nearby, listening. Without argument or question, without a single signal of warning to neighbors or friends, her husband, that little wind-up toy, God's docile errand boy, complied. He built the word to spec, big enough to hold two of every creature, but too small for her mother, too small for her brother, no matter how she wept. From planks of gopher wood smeared with pitch, Noah built the word and God shut them up in it. Water crushed down from the sky, fountained from the seas, dissolving living dust and breath to reefs of hushed mud. And Noah, a silent man in a silenced world, drifting in a wooden word. With an otter placid as a stole across his shoulders, instead of talking, he lived in his hands, picking knits, troughing food and water, always more water, tending, tending to every walking, creeping, winged thing, to all beings but her, never lying beside her, never tasting the taste of sleep, his tongue withered to a husk. The dark hold was mobbed with chitter, roar, and screech without restraint, and from outside the ceaseless babble of wood and rain. She was drowning in languages she couldn't speak, and he never offered her a word of comfort. When the rains finally ended, Noah bound a rope to the rafters before the raven, before the doves, he lowered himself from the word's one window. A splash, and he leashed the rope to his ankle, leaned back, and let his hands fall empty, let the flood embrace him. Grime sloughed from him into the waves until the only animal he smelled was himself. Noah bobbed there, a beaming buoy, tethered to the word in which the future floated, where his wife unseen, the new Eve, humanity's unnamed mother, looked out from the window and watched as he gave himself to the killing waters, looked past him, trying not to think of the death and rot that brothed him. Is a man good, she wondered, who can construct a word large enough for only a chosen few? And now, no matter what promise once rainbowed the sky, before the world is again silenced, the water and weather already rising, already tearing the roofs from the poorest among us, instead of floating unnoticed past those taken by the tides, can't we build a peaceful fleet? lashed by syntax and spring lines into a sentence of survival, words that welcome 
not just some, but all. Thank you. Yeah, kind of one of the fun projects of this book was to take the stories that you'd heard a million times, like, you know, the animals went to the ark two by two, right? And to actually imagine how crazy that would be to be on a boat with all of those animals and like what it smelled like and sounded, right? So that was kind of the last seven years was weird imaginings. Um, okay, this poem, I dare say, is funny. And if you guys are this quiet, it's going to be very uncomfortable. So. <laughs> Um, I know we're in poetry church, but you can totally laugh. It is okay. Also, it's going to get real dark later. I'm just like fair warning about the reading. So like laugh now while you can. Um, so, so another time, oddly, when I was like very deep in biblical research and I was kind of mapping what I was reading onto the world was when I was hanging out uh, at the gay beaches in Provincetown. Obviously, right? Totally. Place for Torah. Um, and you know, there's like the ladies' beach and the dudes' beach, and then there's this like long, you know, space between them. And I was like, this is kind of like an Orthodox service where you <laughs> you separate, it, right? Yeah. Um, sorry, but that's what occurred to me. Um, the only word you need to know is the word mechitza, which is the the cloth that generally divides the services from the genders. Uh, Oh, and the other thing that you should know, um, this is, you did not learn this in Sunday or Saturday school, I promise, um, is that back in the day um, when men would make an oath to each other, um, they would cup each other's junk. It's true. Um, translators say, I'm going to put my hand under your thigh, but that's actually what it means. And there is historic research to back me up, I promise you. Um, so here's a quote from Genesis to start out. I'm not making this up. Uh, and Abraham said to his servant, put your hand prey under my thigh that I might make you swear by the Lord. So there you go. Saturday services at the Provincetown shore. Just off the parking lot, the lesbians come prepared. Our section, a series of small encampments fortified with tense coolers, canvas chairs, and the occasional baby under a pop-up sunshade. A sunscreen slathered dealer shuffles cards onto a folding table. But down along Mechitza of pebbled sand, the masters of minimalism, men, <laughs> with little more than flip-flops and hand towels. Oceanfront anthropologist, trespasser between tribes, I jog past. Note how the sculpted Vs of their backs arrow to an outcropping of asses polished as tumbled stones. At the shoreline, a man flips into a handstand, penis flapping like a windsock in low breeze. Inverted Michelangelo until his scan for admirers unkilters him into the surf. A seagull skims out, wings slow clapping the water. Behind me, the land of women gripping beer koozies, fanning themselves with hands of Texas hold'em. All return, I'm required. All my stuff is still there. And yes, Sorry, men can make a bit much of their manhood. Uh, family jewels, third leg, second brain. But the trappings of comfort can obscure unadorned need. And for just this barefoot mile, I let myself envy their economy, the premium they place on desire. Two by two, men enter the dunes. Because anyone taking an oath, said Rashi, must hold in their hand a sacred object. And because circumcision was Abraham's first commandment and came to him through suffering and was beloved to him, he chose it as the object on which his servant swore. For these moments they share, no matter what Leviticus says, pursing tight its prurient verses. These men, too, are taking a kind of oath. Our bodies are all we entail. All right. And because I hear that it's spring, 
it was spring in North Carolina. Um, it's, I, th I think you're like, you're edging toward that right now, which is exciting. Um, I felt like it would be good to read a love poem. Um, good, okay, yeah, I'm glad you approve. Um, and it's, it's a little strange for me reading love poems from this book because I'm reading poems that grew out of a marriage that is no longer, right? But in thinking about it further, I realize that it's really important to just kind of say that just because something doesn't last doesn't mean that it wasn't worthwhile. So uh, this poem begins with a quote from the poet Jean Valentine. Blessed are they who remember that what they now have, they once longed for. At first sight, many seeings later. Lifting my chin, my wife said, when you look at my breasts like that, you make my face feel lonely. So this was new marriage on a Wednesday morning. I'm glad you got that. That was a joke. <laughs> um, so this was new marriage on a Wednesday morning. When Rebecca saw Isaac the first time, he was striding the noon field. A man at full sunlight, he cast no shadow. From her camel, most translators spin nafal into a lighted, allowing her some dignity. The truth is, it means she fell. In a cloud of desert dust, Rebecca was a smitten, resplendent heap, lantering up at her future mate. The truth is, in the beginning, her face was too much for me. The force of my desire matched. Now, years on, we have matching slippers. And each night on the couch, between us, the dog snores. How little we look at what we think we know, less seeing than simply noting, yes, still there. Yet if the past of love is longing, the future grief, at least for one of us, let the present praise the little brown bird of the familiar, this swift flown into the sweet sheet of her skin, wings in upstroke, the apexed angles of her collarbone. Let me fall from my camel again and again. Let me gaze up and see her new. Thank you. Um, but things can't be all gay beaches and love poems, so. <laughs> The, the Torah is pretty dark. Um, there's a lot of things that are super hard to read and to sit with. Um, but there's this idea that, you know, whatever you believe about the authorship of this text, that it's sacred, right? And when something is sacred, it means you can't just cast it aside. And that if something is too hard or you're not getting something from it, it's not that there's something wrong with the book, right? Like how we do that with novels when we're sitting in a literature class and we say, is, you know, is this good, right? That's not a question here. It's how can I sit with this long enough that I can find a way to learn from it? And for me, um, one, that's changed the way that I approach pretty much every part of my life um, because I try to imagine like, this isn't just difficult, but what, what can I learn from this moment? Um, and especially the, the story that most felt that way to me was the story of the binding of Isaac. Um, so here is the son that Abraham has been waiting for and waiting for his second son, who's supposed to carry on his line. Um, and God says, go sacrifice your son, basically as a test of, of Abraham's belief. Um, and especially in this moment when it feels like everyone is taking sides on issues that have countless sides, right? And is making, you know, definitive statements. Um, I just can't help but wonder what would happen if we approach each other with curiosity and compassion and have nuanced, loving conversations um, instead of just kind of yelling past each other. Um, so this, this poem opens with a quote by the philosopher Eric Hoffer. Absolute faith 
corrupts as absolutely as absolute power. Why there is no Hebrew word for obey. What came later was the real trial because God knew Isaac would not die while Abraham climbed the mountain believing he would. With conviction tempered in the fires of his faith, he walked up through the shaded valley, his son resolute ahead on the trail. Behind them, Sarah, Isaac's mother, Abraham's wife, a small darkness in the distance, growing forever smaller. He bound his beloved son, pulled back his legs, wrenched back his arms, knotted his ankles to his wrists, and laid him on that altar like a child falling through the sky. He held the knife knowing from every animal he'd ever sacrificed how his son would jerk and shudder when the blade opened his throat, the familiar smoke of offered flesh. What came later, even with Isaac alive in the fields, inside Abraham was the knowledge of what he'd been willing to do. When they passed in the tent, Isaac rubbed a remembered ache in his shoulder and never again held his father's eye. Sarah smelling the imagined ashes on her husband's fingers, the blood in the crease of his throat turned from him in the night. And on every path Abraham walked from that day forward, his son as he had been, a small back, barely the span of his hand, slung with the kindling meant for his burning. Seconds from the slaughter of the one meant to carry his line of the son he'd wanted all his life, who's to say the voice in his head was God? Judaism is not a faith, but a tradition. And isn't doubt the crux of conscience? Yet what came later on a Sabbath morning, centuries on, was a congregation in Pittsburgh reading this story of Isaac's binding, of Abraham's terrible bind, when a man burning with unquestioning belief entered with a gun and with no better angel to stay his hand, opened fire, believing the death of Jews would keep our country safe. Believing this massacre, elderly congregants bleeding out on the floor was God's work. Who would call such actions holy? And how many more times will each of us come down from the mountain, conviction knocking like a knife in our belt loop, stained with all we would have done. My daily gods are minor ones of pride, of lust, of impatience and complacency. Yet how many have I harmed on the way to what I thought was right? Or, with hindsight, on the way to what I wanted? And how many sorry sacrifices have I made of myself? What if we turn from certainty and arm ourselves instead with questions? Obey, obey, obey is everywhere in translation. The real word is shma, listen. Thank you. Um, but this, this process also helped me through things that were m much more personal, uh, much closer to home. And so um, when my mother was diagnosed with uh, early onset dementia, being able to kind of keep this conversation with the text um, helped me through this and, and helped me feel like, 
okay, I was in a community where these things had happened before. Um, so here's a poem. I, I grew up in Florida, and that's where I would go um, whenever I would, I would go out down there to help. How long before? To move in the wet heat of Florida summer is to be carried in the mouth of an animal. But inside my parents' house, kept chill as a mausoleum, my mother paces and weeps. In a ragged nightgown, she refuses to change. Her hands, two anxious dishcloths, trying to wring themselves dry. Because I am not the person I'd like to be, I shut the door on this, on my father's poor job of pretending not to cry. And between fences draped in air potato vines, beetle eaten to a path of tattered valentines, I run as though I could leave any of this behind. As Joseph tried to when he named his first son Manasseh, he who makes forgetting, a word that hints at memory evaporating like water from a sizzling street, that heat hungry as the silverfish swimming my childhood books, leaving holes in all the old stories. But to name someone after what you say you've forgotten is to make of them a neon arrow to the relentless past, one you'll someday return to. This is not that. The mother I've lost is lost for good. The only cure for such decay is its completion, when she's forgotten even forgetting. In the mountains I've made my home, vine barrens of kudzu, invasive as her illness, mask every gall, burl, and blight. So come, high climber, you foot a night vine. May all her buried memories remain for her unmarked, unnamed. Cover it all with your nullifying green. Be a sea that waves over everything. And if it brings her peace, let her forget even me. But if we're lucky enough um, and we had people who cared for us, um, we eventually get to care for them in return. Um, and so this is a poem that takes its form from um, a, a Jewish prayer called Kianu Amecha, which is about uh, people's relationship to God. And that felt like, like all these different comparisons of how people relate to God. And to me, that felt like a really beautiful way uh, to think about our relationship to our parents. Uh, and there's a quote from Rabbi David Kimhi um, about Joseph, who is the son of Jacob. Just as Joseph was in the lap of his father Jacob 17 years, Jacob was in the lap of Joseph 17 years. Reciprocity. For I was mud, and you were the face pressed to mine, making me in your image. When I was a furnacing fever, you were a dousing river. I word hunger, and you the book by heart. I knew blooming, you pages of my pressed petals. And when I was ambition, you were the open hand, guiding, supporting, letting me go. Now when you have faltered, I am the hand that guides, supports, promises not to let go. Your memories, blossoms browning on the vine, your tongue hungry for right words. I am the book of your life, offering you back to you. You furnace with fear, I am the river to calm your feet in. And when one day you finally rest, I will be the face that keeps your face in the world.
Uh, and for this last poem, at least the title is happy. So <laughs> that's something. Uh, and then we, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you all so much. Um, it's just been really beautiful. Um, and I really look forward to talking with you, Shoshana. It's going to be an honor. Um, so the poem is called Mazel Tov. See, it's like a happy, right? Yeah. Um, I'm always excited when you find out a word that you've been saying like forever um, is actually kind of mistranslated. So um, that feels like a real opportunity for poetry. So Mazel Tov. Circular breather. My dog can whine without ceasing, his tail thumping the wall beside the bed to call me up and out to the yard instead. In moonlight, the hydrangea's white blossoms are a zodiac of branch-bound constellations. Once God called Abraham out from his tent to the open field to count the uncountable lights in the sky, promising offspring bountiful as dust, numerous as the stars. Like Abraham, I too left my land, my birthplace, my father's house. But the closest I have to offspring is lifting his leg at the azalea. Nose busy with the news the night air brings. Mazel tov, we say, at births and other joyous occasions. The Jewish go-to for congratulations. Yet tov means good, and mazel, constellation, or destiny. And sometimes, like Abraham, you must leave the place that grew you to grow toward better stars. In the house, my love is sleeping. Along the fence top, a procession of possums reminds that even in darkness, there are those who can see. Above trees thick with summer frame a porthole of sky. Maybe, though, it's not always the stars that matter, but the space between them, the lines we draw to shape the absence, the lives we forge around what goes missing. So if I wish you mazel tov, know what I'll mean is, may you live beneath good stars and find a reason to open your door to the night. From the deck, the cool breeze makes a festival of the silver lit leaves. Under my palm, the warmth of his fur, the rise of his ribs. He doesn't suspect his kidneys are failing, that his muzzle is white as the winter the vet has said he will not live to see. Like all of us, he is dying. Like most of us, he doesn't know it. His chin on my leg, he trusts me with the weight of his head. May the darkness be as much a blessing as the stars. Thank you. Is that working? Yeah. No, it is. Thank you, Matt, for having me here. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Shoshana. Uh, I will wish you mazel tov, even if it's a mistranslation. 
on this book? I think we might have. I don't know. We can just hand it back. Is that yeah. what we should do? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so muscle tub on this book. Um, I guess I wanted to go back to something you said earlier. You talked about how um, I think you said prayer was something you didn't really connect to maybe earlier or something that prayer, prayer, prayer. prayer. Um, and I, I was struck by that because I often think of poetry as very much akin to prayer. And I was curious how, you know, whether in writing this book, whether that changed how you feel about prayer or not and how. Um, I, I think that poetry and prayer, um, yeah, they definitely feel really connected. But I think oftentimes the way that I thought about prayer was, um, I don't know if you all have gone to church or synagogue or the mosque or anything, but like in, in the synagogues I would go to, it was kind of people saying the prayers by rote um, and, and, and not understanding what they were saying or really caring about it. Um, and that didn't, like, whereas when I was studying, it felt like I was like connected to something way bigger than me. Um, yeah, and so for me, poetry did become a means of prayer, but I also realized that it was super hypocritical to like teach about prayer and, to, um, and not try it myself. So I started trying to integrate um, bits of prayer like the moda'ani, when you wake up and you say, I am grateful basically to like be here and have breath. Um, so for the last two years, that's how I start my day, um, which then of course feeds back into the poetry. Thank you. Yeah, there are a lot of references to prayer throughout the book. Um, you talk about how I, Abraham start, is sort of credited with inventing the morning prayer and uh, Isaac the afternoon, et cetera. Um, I wanted to come to the poem, I think this might have been the first one you read, or, or one of the first ones, Collective Nouns, um, about uh, Noah and the ark, and you talk about the word teva, the Hebrew word teva, which it means ark, but also means word. Um, and I was really struck by that because I was thinking about how the Hebrew word um, bayit means house and also stanza, and how in English the word for word and world are just a single letter apart. Um, or removed. And so, I, yeah, I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you think of poetry as a kind of world building, if and how. Yeah. Um, so what's really fascinating to me is, um, so the, the Torah begins, Breshit bara Elohim, right, which is often translating as, in the beginning, God created the world. Um, it has many other translations. Uh, Breshit is actually plural, so there could be like many beginnings of the world, which is sort of mind blowing. Um, but bara, to create something from nothing, ex nihilo, is something only God can do. Um, and whereas we as people, um, we yotzer, we form uh, our we form our art out of the world around us, our lives out of the, the world around us. And so to me, I want to take in as much of the world as possible. I want to do that through study, but I also want to do it through my body. I want to go places. I want to pay attention um, because I think I was talking with Tiana's class about this, that we don't just write with our minds, right? We have to take these abstractions, these feelings and these ideas and put them in concrete images in order to carry them across to an audience, to a reader. Um, and so to me, that's what we as writers do, is we don't create something out of nothing, but we take our experience of the world and have the audacity to say like, hi stranger, <laughs> you know, like maybe, maybe that you need this, right? And have a conversation. Thank you. Um, I wanted to move to the poem, Shadow of Babel. Um, and I was really struck by this poem. Um, the speaker, I, I won't assume it's you, refers to themselves as a monoglot. Um, but sprinkled throughout this collection are words from another language, right? Hebrew, um, and not even in transliteration. You have them, um, these words in Hebrew alphabet in the, in the text. So I was going to ask you a little bit about the process. What made you decide, firstly, to include Hebrew words, um, words from another language in a sort of non-Latin alphabet? Um, and what were some of the challenges involved in doing that? 
There are many, um, so I'll start with the challenges. Um, so Hebrew is read from right to left, right, versus English is reversed. Um, so a lot of times when you pour text into a book design program, uh, it actually transposes all the Hebrew words. Um, so even though I had had my manuscript proofed, I, I realized once I got the proofs and all of the Hebrew was backwards, <laughs> that I was going to have to like really slow down to proof this this book. Um, but the reason that it felt worthwhile to me is, one, I think even if you don't read Hebrew, it gives an interesting texture to the poems. Um, but for people who do, Hebrew has like so much texture and meaning, and the, the etymology is so important. So I didn't want to just have transliteration. But at the same time, I will often see poems that have language and other characters, but it's not transliterated. So I, 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 as someone who don't speak that language, am not allowed into the, the musicality of it. Um, so I wanted to kind of welcome as many people as possible into this experience, which is why um, every poem has the Hebrew characters, a transliteration, and then a translation. Um, and I tried to think of that sonically as well. Um, I am a monoglot. I learned, <laughs> I learned, I have a little bit of Hebrew. I, I learned very badly just enough biblical Hebrew to like kind of hang out with the text and look at etymology, but we're not going to have a conversation. So. <laughs> not going to speak in Hebrew now. <laughs> um, so in the same poem, I was struck by a quote you have here from Charlemagne who says that and I'm quoting, to have another language is to possess a second soul. Um, I, lo I love that quote, and it made me think of a book that I recently read called Soul House by Muriel Gunzel, a poet and translator who works between German and Vietnamese in her own native French. Um, and in her book, she talks about words as a kind of shelter. So I guess this kind of brings me back to my first question, this idea of language as itself providing shelter or a home. And I wanted to ask, can you talk about how language, your own and maybe also this other language, Hebrew, um, specifically biblical Hebrew, right? You're, you're using biblical Hebrew here, not, not modern Hebrew. How that served you as a kind of home or soul house? I love that phrase. I love the phrase soul house. That's really beautiful. Uh, I, I think that um, I was reading the biography of uh, Gershom Sholem, uh, who is a very famous um, scholar of especially like Kab uh, Kabbalah and like, like mysticism, Jewish mysticism. And um, it said that uh, he learned Hebrew in order to learn how to be silent in Hebrew. <laughs> and I was just like, and, and that was so beautiful to me, the idea of like different languages of silence. Um, and so, I'm very, I'm not good at languages. Like when I travel, I can get just enough to get by. Um, but what sitting with biblical Hebrew did for me is it's a very, um, as you know, a very vocabulary poor language. Um, and so oftentimes you'll see the same word show up like three times in the same sentence. Uh, and it, you know, so it'll be like, hear this dream that I have dreamt. And translators will usually put synonyms in there because that can sound kind of clunky in English, but I actually felt like it sounded so majestic and, and, and it gave me permission to do that. And to me, that's part of like that idea of a second soul, right? Like is that all of a sudden you, you see another way of being. Um, and I really love that. And I also just feel like anything you learned for me here, it was Torah, but like if you all are in the sciences or you're studying architecture or whatever, that's another language too, right? And, and it, do, it doesn't just have to live in your textbook or like in, in your classroom. You get to take it if you're also a writer and it becomes a new metaphor, it becomes a new lens by which to see the world, right? Thank you. Yeah, I feel like that's a really also nice way of thinking back to the story of Babel, which you allude to in the other poem, or you more than allude to, right? This sort of idea of the many languages being a kind of confusion, right? Presenting this confusion or... Yes, but it was, um, yes and, uh, yes, yes and um, a confusion, but what I love was there was one interpretation, because I was like, isn't it great if we all spoke the same language? Like, why would God mess that up? Like, what's wrong? Um, and. And then I read an interpretation that Babel was actually the first totalitarian state. 
because everybody had to talk the same language, right? And that was the only one. And that that was why God broke it apart. And that was kind of, yeah, what I was exploring. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, that, that way in which the multiplicity of languages can, can sort of work on both, on both fronts, I guess, um, in both ways. So I wanted to step back a minute and ask you a little bit about your process. Um, I mean, as, as you made clear, um, and as you know, anybody who's read this book can see, this, these poems are obviously all in conversation with the book of Genesis and organized around the, three section, the 12 sections, Parshia, that make up that first of the five books of the Pentateuch. Um, so your book obviously joins a rich tradition of midrashic interpretation of these texts. Um, and many of your poems also include epigraphs. And you read some of those now for us tonight, um, some of them from the Bible, some from rabbinic commentaries, some from contemporary poems, um, biblical criticism, contemporary criticism. So I was just going to ask a little bit about the process of writing and compiling these poems. Yeah. How did you put it all together? <laughs> uh, very slowly is the answer. Um, yeah. So. Um, so Genesis, as you said, is divided into 12 portions. And in the Hebrew calendar, you read a portion a week. And what I loved about it is it gave me discrete chunks of text to investigate. Um, so I would actually sit with four or five translations and the Hebrew text uh, and take a ton of notes. And it was whatever felt most alive, most electric. Um, I would start answering back, and I would make like almost like marginalia on my own notes. Uh, I would argue, I would like, if I all of a sudden like a weird memory from my childhood, like I would make note of that. And a lot of times that marginalia would become the start of a poem. Um, I also read a ton of contemporary scholars. Um, my dear friend, Bert Vizotsky, uh, there's an amazing midrashist, uh, Aviva Zornberg, uh, and they also helped inform my thinking on this. Um, but I also just really tried to think about writing this book and the study of it changed my entire life. I mean, it really did. Um, it changed the way that I see the world. It changed the way that I am in community. And so I was always trying to think, how can I communicate this to someone else? And how can I open up these texts in a way that often feel closed, right? Like people feel very wounded by religion because they're given a religion that tells them they can't be who they believe that they are. Uh, and so I wanted to write poems that said like, no, this is ours. We get to make this ours. Thank you. That's really beautiful. And it brings me back to the poem you read um, that ends with, you know, obey, obey, obey. But Shema really means listen, right? Um, so the idea of being asked questions and come to it with curiosity instead of this feeling of rigidity of religious religion. Um, but I wanted to, I guess, touch on also, um, you know, another way that you make this, this um, the book of Genesis sort of maybe relatable or, or bring it into our current moment is, you know, you give voice to or otherwise make visible a lot of the women of the Bible, of the Hebrew Bible, most of whom are voiceless in these stories, right? Uh, many of whom are never even named, as you put it in um, in the poem, How Many More, right? You have this quote, as so many women left uncounted, unnamed. So I wanted to ask if you can share something about how you went about uncovering these stories of women in the, in the Bible and why it was important for you to write them back into the tradition or into the text. Um, first off, I definitely am not the first person to do this. <laughs> um, and I want to give credit. Um, so Eleanor Wilner, who um, taught here that I got to study with, is someone who writes incredible midrashic poems. Alicia Ostreicher is another poet and scholar uh, who had a feminist reclaiming of these texts and said, like, no, these are for women, too, right? That this isn't, even though they're probably written by dudes, like, <laughs> we can admit that. Um, and, and so for me, you know, one of the things I kept thinking about is like, I, you know, a part of, part of what I do when I teach is like analyze structure. And I was thinking like, how can something be written that is so old and it still speaks to us, right? Like, how is that possible? And part of it, right, is, is how spare it is. It has all these holes in it. And each of the, the gaps in the text is like an invitation. It's a mystery inviting you to read something new into it. And so the Torah, right, any holy text is 
in some ways a document of what men felt it was worthwhile to record. And so what I felt like my job was as a poet was to say, what are the quiet parts? What's the tenderness? What's often the feminine that wasn't deemed worthy to make it onto the page? But there's evidence of it. And to see how I you know, might redeem that in some way, again, following in like so many other people's footsteps. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to come to this theme that I noticed recurring throughout the book. Um, the question of free will versus fate comes up again and again. How much agency we have over the shape of our lives, right? Um, I'm thinking of poems like Free Will, um, and I'll just open up to the page so I can read. Um, so this one opens with an epigraph from the book of Genesis, of course. Um, this one, uh, just prior to um, when Cain kill, kills Abel, right? So God said to Cain, where you do right, there is uplift, but where you do not, sin crouches at your door. It longs for you, but you can rule over it. So God tells Cain, you have control, you have agency here. Um, but then there are other poems as well where you, um, you refer to this. I mean, there are many, but I'll, I'll just point a couple more. Um, the poem, uh, In the Breath Between. I'll just open that one as well. Um, I think that's one of the last ones, right? Um, which opens, all is foreseen, said Rabbi Akiva, and freedom is given, which is like this central conundrum, right? Um, it's all foreseen, but it's, but freedom, we have the freedom still. So yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, why is this such a central focus of the book? And how would you say that writing these poems helped you grapple with this? Thank you, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, right, like, isn't that, that's so bizarre that there could be omniscience, that everything is foreseen, and yet somehow we have free will. Like you just kind of like break your brain on that a little bit. Um, I mean, so like in in the other poem, first off, um, it there's it's it's drawing on the work of Viktor Frankl, um, who's an incredible philosopher who um, was in a camp in the Holocaust, and he he realized that even more than food, even more than shelter, the thing that's going to keep you alive is by having some will. Right, some reason that you believe that you are here and that you need to live. Uh, and as, as part of that, what he said was, you know, yeah, people in the camps, like they can take away everything from you, but what they can't take away is how you respond to what they do to you. And, and to me, that's an incredibly powerful idea. Um, and so in this kind of grappling with you know, what does it mean to have free will? I also really drew on the idea that in Judaism, um, there's no original sin. I love that. There's no original sin. Like, we're, we're okay. All of us is okay. Uh, and what? <laughs> 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 no, no. <laughs> it's, um, so we, <laughs> yeah, it's all derivative sin. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's all plagiarized sin. Exactly. It's not original. Uh, but it's the idea that we, there's the idea that we have inside of us um, yetzer hara, right, the evil impulse, and yetzer hatov, the impulse for good. Um, but there's a story, I'm sure you know, that the rabbis captured um, yetzer hara, the wicked impulse, and they're like, yay, no more sin. And then like, no chickens had eggs, and no couples made love, and no one went to work, because there was no desire, there was no animating force. And they realized that you cannot live without both of those things, and it's a question of like balance. And to me, that's where free will comes in, is like feeling all these different urges and then figuring out how I'm gonna respond to something. And, 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 and also that's, that's a process, which is why there's also repentance, um, because we don't always make the right choice, but we can, we can maybe do better next time, so. I'm curious, though, if you can say more about the writing process and how the writing process brings you to the process of the balance between, you know, was this book foreseen? <laughs> Sorry, I'd much rather just talk about the text. Um, uh, my writing process. Uh, <laughs> was it foreseen? Well, I think that's for someone that's above my pay grade. Um, but <laughs> but um, I think what I could do is... Um, there's the idea of, of kavana, of intention. And 
that you, you don't do things mindlessly, right? But that you bring your full self to bear. And so what I think I learned through writing this book was how to fully show up uh, and how to not just look at like how difficult the world is and how awful people can be, which like that's really easy to do, but to say how are these darknesses reflected in myself and to use writing almost as a means of excavation uh, and, and a mirror. Right, and that, that was the process here. Um, so maybe that didn't happen in a first draft, but that's when I knew I had to keep pushing and pushing the poems. And it wasn't really until I implicated myself in some way and felt vulnerable and kind of scared that I knew I had like found the real version of the poem. And would it be too much of a stretch to say that was where you exerted your free will? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Is too much of a no. Yeah, no, I think that's where I exerted my free will. It, <laughs> because a lot of times, right, I'm sure you all have done this, you write serviceable poems. You write pleasing poems. Um, there was a poet that I talked to that was like good dog poems, where you're like, good dog, that's great. Um, and, and it's much harder to write the like scary, messy poems. And yes, so for me, I made a choice that it was more important for me. I truly did not know if any one of these poems would ever get published, and I certainly didn't know if a whole book of them would get published. Um, and so to me, it was, I wrote these poems in order to learn. And that was my free will, that was my choice. Thank you. Um, so another sort of recurring motif or theme in this book is, is memory and forgetting, or remembrance and forgetting, um, which is obviously not, not at all surprising, given how much the Hebrew Bible enjoins us over and over again to remember and not to forget. Um, but of course, in this book, it takes on added urgency in your poems that address your mother's um, condition, which you reflect on with such poignancy in Kaddish for the Living. Um, let me open it up. I did not note the page number, but you should be able to find that. Also, while, while I'm looking, I'll say Kaddish is also, of course, a prayer, right? Coming back to prayer. There's a lot of prayer in this book for someone who wasn't very into prayer. Trying to figure it out. 61, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so you have, um, like Isaac, my mother is dead, but not. The automatic operations lost, driving, turning on a stove, following a plot. Yeah, I mean, those, the, those are just some of the lines that stood out to me, but I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about you know, what that very injunction in the, in the Torah opened up for you in dealing with your mother's involuntary loss of memory and how you wrestled with both the personal and the biblical in these poems. Um, I mean, I think personally, if you have a parent who has Alzheimer's, uh, that kind of puts a possible deadline on things for you. I mean, you don't know if that, like, I don't know if that's in my future, but it definitely makes me not want to waste time right now. Um, and, you know, it, what was interesting to, in this poem, so it goes on to talk about how in the Kaddish, which is the traditional prayer that we say for the dead, um, you don't, you don't really talk about death. You just like praise God and you ask for peace, um, which was kind of weird and upsetting when I first realized that. But then I was, I, again, right, I had to sit with it long enough to say, oh, okay, well, isn't that what we want, right? Like what if, what if we can get to the point where we can, and this is again saying that there is a plan beyond us, giving up free will a little bit, um, that we can actually say thank you for this, right? Like thank you, even though it feels really bad and really sad now, like in Judaism you say to someone when they die, may their memory be a blessing. Um, and to me that's like, can you get to a point where you can remember someone and it's not just pain, but you can remember the joy a little bit too. Um, so I was constantly going back and forth between the text um, as a way of opening up and explicating the text, and also then in turn seeing how the text explicated my life, and then how vice, right, and then how my life could maybe open up the text. Um, and it was sort of this back and forth process through the whole thing. Thank you. 
Um, I think I'll, yeah, I wanted to close maybe with this question um, that brings us back to sort of where we opened. Um, so I'd, I'd opened by asking you about words as home or shelter, and I wanted to go back to look at language itself as a kind of creative force, right, which is central to the creation story. Um, you know, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, which is the epigraph. You use that as the epigraph to a poem that begins, and God speaks words that enter the world as things. Um, and the same poem closes with these lines, each word carries what it names inside. I think you read that, or maybe you read that in your introduction. Yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful line. Each word carries what it names inside, and like a folded paper flower blooming in water find its, finds its form in the moment of its speaking. It's such a beautiful, evocative reflection on the power of language, not merely to name, but to instantiate what it names, um, which makes me think of sort of speech act theory and the idea that certain utterances have the power to enact something in the world, literally, right? Um, so all of this is a long way of asking you, what is it that you believe poems can do in the world? Or maybe what is it that you hope the poetic utterances on the page or on the stage can affect? If not in the world, then in this room, or in the mind of a single reader at a moment in time. I'm glad you saved an easy one for last. <laughs> uh, so I was kind of a weird kid, kind of a lonely kid, uh, growing up in Florida. And um, the world felt really small, right? The world around me. Um, I'm sure none of you felt that way. But um, the books let me know that there is a larger world, right? Books let me know that one day there would be people who liked me for who I was, um, that there would be a place for me. Uh, and so, I, honestly, I think that's a huge part of why I became a writer, was to write something with the belief that if I could write something that I really needed, that maybe if I was lucky enough, I could one day give that to a reader who also felt lonely, who felt like their, word was, their world was very small, and it might make them feel, right, unalone, right? It might make them feel companioned in some way. And I think that's what poetry can do, is it can help us see the world new, and it can also let us know that no matter how alone we feel, that there's always some mind out there that we can resonate with. Uh, and to me, there's there's nothing more beautiful that I could do. So, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you, Matt. I was asked to let you know that there is a book signing happening right here, right? <laughs> <laughs>